wow. Uh, that was so, uh, that was so super cool. Um, for those of you who were around earlier, uh, that was the track from Day and during Ad 2's panel, which was, when was that? <laughs> At one o'clock today, um, uh, Ad played um, a clip of Day meeting her um, mentor, hero, mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, and she would, yeah. So uh, this get, just gets deeper and deeper and more significant and emotional. Uh, uh, yeah. So it's time for our next panel. And also it's time for um, another, um, oh my goodness. It's time for another. Tanya's ready with this. Oh, this is just insane over here. It's time for another. Sorry, I can't even see where this is going. All right. It's time for another scratch. Sarah, hello. Do you, did you get a card in the mail? Or do oh, you, I don't think oh, I did. Do you have any idea what we're doing right now? The scratch? No, I'm afraid I did not get one of those. <laughs> Well, I, I apologize because you could be scratching and sniffing with us right now um, in, in recognition of this, um, uh, this panel. Um, I would like you to scratch panel number six. Sarah is just like, call my manager, what's going on? Get me, I've got a previous engagement, get me out of here. Uh, can anybody tell me what panel number six is? Oh, it smells like that to me, but I know what it is because I printed it. I Honestly, I think it's a pretty good, anybody want to jump in with a, No. Oh, well, because we're talking about uh, alternative touring, uh, and I have a, a, a picture in my head of Galen Lee in a field in Ireland, um, number six is the smell of freshly cut grass. Like, <laughs> Jamie's like, are you fucking kidding me? That is not, it is, it is. Oh, thank, play along, come on. Oh my goodness, it's just as if I'm outside. It is, what is it then? That's freshly cut grass. Yeah, anybody else wanna argue? So, uh, we're, we're several hours into this right now. Um, it's the best freshly cut grass smell ever. Thank you, Mark, for your support. Um, uh, how about if um, our panelists today, uh, uh, Sarah McDonald, uh, Galen Lee, uh, Shannon Curtis and Jamie Hill, each, uh, would you all care to introduce yourselves? Would that be, would that be good? Uh, Sarah, would you like to start? Sure. Hi, I'm Sarah McDonald, and I'm here in my apartment in New York. That's it. <laughs> well, and, um, I said earlier, you, you, this is the best name I've ever heard, the New York, is it the New York City Chill Harmonic or the New York Chill Harmonic? The New York Chill Harmonic, yeah. That's the best name I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> so flattered, thank you. Uh, um, what is the Chill Harmonic? Uh, the New York Chill Harmonic is my big band, but it's not a big band. It's just a very large ensemble with, um, I think, 13 horns, a string quartet, like a prog rhythm section. And I sing and play keys, and it's like a whole thing. Yeah. That seems like a lot of people. 
Yeah, it's 18 people now. It used to be 22, but I got rid of two trombones and added a tuba because it made more sense. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Right, yeah. I was, I was just going to suggest the same thing. Get rid of the, lose two of the trombones, not all of the trombones. You didn't just a couple, yeah. yeah exactly. Uh, <laughs> Shannon, uh, Shannon and Jamie. Um, hi, uh, your mic is on mute. So that would be the, there you go. There we go. It's not like we don't have experience with Zoom after 2020, but here we are. Yeah. <laughs> so Shannon, you wrote a book. Well, you're an artist in your own right. And you wrote a book about house concerts. Yes, um, we stumbled into doing uh, community driven house concerts uh, where we like taught people in our community how to become hosts of house concerts. And we've been doing this for nine years. Uh, and we have not slowed down even in pandemic riddled 2020. We, we just did it virtually instead of in person. We just finished a 50 show Zoom concert. Tour. Tour. Hmm. See, but I, I think the last time I, we spoke a few months ago, and I think I remember just before I, before I emailed you, or before we before I called you, thinking, okay, I'm going to be prepared for a litany of problems and woe, and just things are going great. We're doing everything virtually. I'm like, okay. Um, of course, you know my suggestion that I didn't make to you. Was yeah. it to do two concerts a day now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah you could you could do that yeah although you know what they are as energetically draining i mean in the best possible way but like they're like a real concert they're like an in-person concert in terms of energy doing two would be like a regular double header doable but real hard yeah yeah i i know i was just making the i was just making the excel spreadsheet <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know and i just want to i want to second uh sarah's brass math I totally believe that two trombones equals one tuba. <laughs> definitely, definitely. I also lost a couple of trumpets too, but I figured it would just unify everything. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and as much as I'd like, you know, as much as I'd like to, you know, make comments about an 18 member band, the last pig face show in Chicago, we had five plus drum kits and three bass players. So who am I to talk? Um, uh, Jamie, um, yes. What, want to tell us a little bit about yourself? I'd love to. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Jamie Hill. I am an independent record producer and mix engineer. I produce and mix records for a wide variety of independent music and alternative music artists. And I mentor a ton, like a small army at this point, of uh, budding producers, home recordists, uh artists who want to learn how to self-record and empower themselves in that way so they can hopefully eventually not need people like me um that i i like that because it seems like why would you do yourself out of a job but you're not you're just you're just elevating uh you're just elevating every you just end up working with people uh, at, at, a, at a higher level um, it's wonderful yeah like i definitely like have worked myself out of some mix gigs but now I'm just mastering those records. And that's great, you know? It's, it's, a, it's a joy to get a well-mixed record that someone else did that I walked them through and to see them growing as an engineer through that process and like learning advanced techniques. And then to see the fruits of that coming to me as the, you know, the two track mixes and then like getting to do my thing and I can still participate, it's wonderful. And how, are you doing that? Are you doing like Zoom sessions? Or? You know, you know, I tend to find that for what I do, asynchronous works best. So it tends to be Dropbox and email. So, you know, the typical pattern is that someone will send me an MP3 of a work in progress. I'll listen to it a bunch of times and make detailed notes. Uh, and some of them will be really like, you know, on the impressionistic, you know, think of this in terms of different color you know, kind of note. And some of it will be really specific. You have a bubble in the bass at 92 hertz. Here's how to deal with that. You know what I mean? 
Uh, and I'll send them a detailed list of notes. And then on their own time, they can uh, work through that. Uh, you know, I try to always keep it as vague as possible as much as I am able to, just to not be too didactic and to leave a lot of room for them to interpret stuff and figure things out on their own. I'm always much more interested these days in what someone else thinks than what I do. So, you know, if there's obvious stuff that needs to get fixed, I'll point it out. If it's just a general energy management issue, I'll just describe the issue and figure and let them figure the solution out, you know? Oh, and I, it just occurs to me in hearing you talk about this stuff, it, what a... Um, what a very powerful thing to be doing, you know? It seems like some people scream louder, shout, you know, to get their point across and here you are. Uh, it's like I do, if somebody comes running at me in a threatening way, I'll sit down and cross my legs, you know? It seems like you're doing that. In the, That's in the idea, yeah, you know, and it doesn't come naturally to me necessarily. I was raised to be uh, pugnacious and pugilistic and to assert myself in a group dynamic. Uh, and unlearning that has been a total joy to me as an adult. <laughs> and I think has really enabled me to grow a lot as a human, you know, and bringing that to my work has just made my work better and made my interactions better around it. Cause it's not a battle of egos. It's everybody on the same team. And I'm just trying to help someone else be the best version of themselves. Oh, wow. <laughs> Welcome. And, uh, Last but not least is uh, uh, Galen. My, uh, Galen, you're, uh, you know, there you go. Um, uh, welcome, Galen. Um, do you, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, for those of you who weren't here earlier, uh, I'm Galen Lee, I'm a violinist and a songwriter. And for this panel, kind of talking about um, some of my, because of the accessibility issues, some of the more alternative ways that I've toured, um, I do everything DIY and um, access even for those DIY shows is really important for me. And then in the age of COVID kind of, I've been as Jamie and Shannon have, but in a different way, transform my career to be all online right now. And talking about that um, has, I, I like it a lot. I mean, I'm not, not going to go back on the road, but I'm, actually having fun so uh, I'm excited to be on this panel. And I think there are, um, uh, you have additional, uh, it's, it's more dangerous for you to, to be out and about right now. Oh yeah, I was like, not normally. Well yes, in COVID it's much more dangerous. I have, um, I have really bad scoliosis so my spine is very curved so I only have about one third of a regular lung capacity because of the way my spine looks. If you look at an x-ray, it's like an S, like for real, my spine is very crooked. And so I just can't do any respiratory illnesses, but especially not this one where I have no, I don't know, you know, when the hospitals are full, if a doctor would look at me and be like, she's toast and then I wouldn't even get treated. So I'm just not even gonna go down that road. So I've been very, very locked down, um, not even doing like outdoor shows, um, drive-in shows. I just don't wanna find myself in a situation where it's super weird and awkward. Um, so mine are all virtual, but nonetheless have created this thing that I, I plan to continue after COVID, um, even when I get back on the road. Right. Uh, um, so are there any places, Galen, where you have, where, that have been inaccessible for you and therefore uh, uh, previously inaccessible um, that you decided not to perform that now you can at least you can target those areas maybe are you what are you what are you doing within this and how is it being productive for you yeah I guess I could explain a little better um besides just doing gigs that people ask me to do like will you play on our Facebook page, we're a venue and we're having an event. The thing that I'm really excited about during COVID is I started doing a weekly show on YouTube back in March. So March 20th, it was exactly a week after we got home from a canceled tour. We were on our way to Denver and had to turn around in Nebraska and come home. And um, so I started doing these shows once a week and um, played my own stuff at the beginning, realized I wasn't gonna play the same set every single week for the rest of time. So started doing improvisation where people would give me um, a theme and I would start improvising on that. For, and that was really fun. And I didn't know if anyone would like it, but 
because everyone's so stressed out right now, I think it, like instrumental music that's calming is actually something people are getting a lot out of. And then as the pr pandemic pr uh, trajectory kept getting farther and farther out in the future, I decided to start having a special guest every week. So they come on and I do, um, they do three of their own songs and we talk and then I end the show with three or four of my own tunes. So I'm still playing every week, but it's, um, but it's kind of a collaborative show. And then the coolest part is that um, it's all live. So I, I am pretty personally only interested in doing live shows. Like I know some people pre-record and pre-produce. And for me, um, I, I just knew that that wasn't gonna give me any kind of artistic creative energy. And so um, all my shows are live, but I do have a live captioner. So she captions every show, which is an additional cost, but I, I'm covering it through my Patreon. Um, and then just, it's super fun because the audience has become a community where it's just a lot of times the same people are there every week and they're talking not just to me, but to each other now. And so it's become this really neat thing. And there's maybe, we have 35 people live, but then the show lives on forever on YouTube. So people will catch up on it. And it's just become a thing that I am really excited about. I split the tips um, every week with the artist who's on the show with me. So maybe they make 30 to $50, but it's so low key that they're, they're just playing three songs and we're talking and it's, I want to make it like fun for them. But also if I can support them, then I do, you know, we split the tips and it's been super fun and I love it. And I have guests booked out until July right now. And I'm planning to continue on and Jeff Tweedy is coming on from Wilco on December 6th. So I got to learn what I'm doing even more before then because I want it to go really well. So that's, that's pretty wild. That's pretty yeah, wild. Yeah, I'm pumped. So uh, Sarah, how, how are things going with you? What, where did this fall off a cliff for you? What are you salvaging from it? Um, well, I was going to have probably the heaviest touring year of my life this year. Uh, I don't even think I was going to be in the United States all that often. <laughs> um, so I, I lost a lot, but I mean, everybody has, so I'm not alone in that. Um, and I guess, I, you know, I was still kind of holding out hope that the summer would be okay and we were losing these gigs. And also it's, it's a lot. When I tour with a big band, if it's in the United States, I take the rhythm section with me and then I hire um, horn and string players in every single city we go to. So this is not just like booking gigs, which I do all of. I also work as a booking agent um, during the day. And then, so it was like booking these gigs. So if we have like, you know, 50 shows a year, I'm booking these gigs, but I'm also booking all of the personnel for each gig everywhere we go. So it's like hundreds and hundreds of people. And um, so it's, it's just a lot of logistical work. So to be losing that work, losing that touring, it's also like staying in touch with these people and giving them information, you know, because you're just constantly inundated with questions and, you know, when this first started happening, it kind of felt like maybe, you know, things would hold out in the summer and then the fall and then obviously everything just went and it was just this constant barrage of like staying in touch with people, trying to keep everybody updated. And for international stuff, you know, that's even, it's more frustrating in a way, but it's also just me going. So then I book like the entire band once I'm out there, just depending on budgets and things like that. Um, so it was, yeah, it's just kind of like a letdown because like you want to stay in touch with these people and you want to maintain these relationships and connections and, you know, keep them in mind for next time. So it's just like I have a whole book of contacts. But um, yeah, that didn't really answer your question. I kind of went off on a tangent. But yeah, it was just obviously like right away I could sense that this was going to get bad. There was like that two weeks in March where everyone was like, maybe it's going to be fine. And then it very quickly accelerated into where it is now. Um, but in the meantime, I've really been recording remotely a lot. Um, I'm sitting on a lot of stuff right now. We released a single and music video, but obviously like mixing and mastering and producing a big band is already a lot as it is. And then doing it with everybody recording individually from home with their different recording setups is also its own special nightmare. So that's been a lot. So everything takes like twice as long, but it's also like we're just at home. So we just sit on this stuff all the time and I have a studio here and we've been doing a lot of that. We also, you know, like have managed, we shot that video like socially distanced and then um, we actually did manage to play a live show, which was 
great. <laughs> and that was socially distanced as well, but it was in like a huge parking lot. So there were a lot of people there, but everybody was in their own bubble. You know what I mean? Um, so that was nice, but also scary in its own way because you want to see who's comfortable with what and like how people are commuting. Like I haven't taken the subway since March. I walk everywhere. It's insane. Um, other people have cars, but not really. So just, you know, like booking personnel based on their comfortability, you know, and but I think most people were just really excited to play. So it wound up being okay. I think that was the fastest I've ever booked a show. I like text everyone within five minutes, like 18 people were ready to go. <laughs> yeah. Dream it or was it just in person? We didn't stream it just because I was hearing all kinds of weird things at the time about Facebook streaming and think like accounts being deactivated. And I don't even know if that was true or not. So we didn't at the time, but we'll have some live videos coming out to satiate. Twitch, Twitch, there, it's difficult for DJs, um, mm. Instagram, Twitch, uh, I don't know about Facebook, um, but yeah, there's, there's been a lot of that uh, going on. Um, for sure, yeah. I'm, and your day gig is booking? Say that one more time. Your day job, you're a booker as well? Yeah, I'm, oh, <laughs> but I'm still working. If things come in, which is rare at this point, you know, I will take stuff. We had, there was a period of time there where I was booking a lot of European gigs for a minute when people could go there. And I was actually supposed to go and take part of the band with me to play a festival in the Netherlands. And if it had been like a week earlier, we would have been fine, but they went into lockdown like right before. So we literally had flights and all the paperwork and everything, you know, like, the proper documentation to get across the border and then it was I, I knew it was going to happen it was like the last minute they had to cancel so they had to eat those flights you know it happens and, and all my conversations with with my european friends they not only have covid but now they have um brexit um, yeah. so now the separate paperwork to go to each country there are different tax withholding rules um different insurance rules to do with medical yeah just it's just people are just like this is it's just insane just insane um so um shannon you've um uh you wrote a book about house concerts um how how did this all so this is something you've been doing for, you've been touring differently anyway. How, how did you switch and pivot and what's going on and how was it, et cetera? How did we pivot and switch for 2020, you mean? Yeah. So yeah, we've been doing uh, pretty much exclusively house concerts for our touring. Like I, we stopped doing club shows um, several years ago at this point because we were finding that doing these shows in people's living rooms and backyards um you know each each show was hosted by a member of our community someone who supports the music that, that we make um and it was a private event for their guests so their friends families colleagues you know whatever neighbors um and we've been doing that for you know like i said this we did that for eight years in a row and then 2020 hit um it, that was a big you know curveball because our summer tour we, we normally go out and do like three and a half to four months of house concert tour each year. And it is about 75% of our annual income, <laughs> um, you know, doing that, that tour. So it was a big curveball in, you know, uh, the reality of COVID sank in slowly as it did when we realized we weren't going to be able to do that at all. Um, but, you know, <laughs> it's really nice to have a partner <laughs> with whom I, we can, you know, we literally busted out a whiteboard and like just started like generating ideas about how we could pivot in this time. And we came up with two pivots. Um, the one related to touring, which this panel is about, was that we, we essentially moved that entire, like the house concert touring model from an in-person situation to um, via Zoom. And so we chose Zoom because you can have everybody, you can have everybody's Brady Bunch box on the screen. And so you can kind of approximate the idea of people being in the same room together. They can see each other. There can be connection that way. Um, and uh, and we remained, they remained private events. They, each, each show was hosted by a person who was responsible for inviting all the guests who would be at that event, exactly the same as our in-person house concerts. Um, and they were, we, like, like Jamie said, we just finished a 50 show tour on Zoom 
So we went to our basement every night and played a show together um, that went out on Zoom and they were wonderful. Like we really thought that maybe it would be just like a pale substitute for the in-person thing. We thought, you know, it, we're gonna get as close as we can, but it's not gonna be the same and it's not the same. But there were so many aspects of the Zoom concerts that uh, were so rich um, you know, I think that you don't end up at a Zoom anything by accident, you know, so every single person who was there really wanted to be there. They were there with a set with they brought intentionality to their presence there, which made the whole event so much richer and so much more engaged. Um, there, there's something about, you know, uh, being able to like when you're at a regular like in person concert, everybody's facing the stage and looking at the artists, right? But we were encouraging people to watch the show with the gallery view of everybody who was at the show on screen. And so it was a different experience for them in that way because they're not just watching us perform, but they're watching Jennifer watch Martin, watch Molly watch the performance. You know what I mean? So like there's, it was a different, a different experience, different layers than you would get in an in-person house concert. And so like Galen mentioned, we're definitely gonna keep this virtual format around even when we can go back in person and start doing those in-person shows again. Um, and could you talk a little bit about attendance? Is there merch, you know, some, uh, yeah. Do you wanna take this one? Yeah, sure. So uh, we did have merch in theory. It was available, it was for sale. Uh, Typically, uh, any given year, we're right about 55-45, so donations will be 55% of our, uh, I'm sorry? Can you point out, also, we don't charge tickets for these shows if they're all on open donations. So at the conclusion of the show, people are asked to get to contribute what they want to kind of name their own ticket price after they've experienced the show. So when Jamie's saying we're split usually between yeah. donations and merch, that's what he's meaning. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and, and to be super even like, clearer about that, there's no suggested donation. There's no suggested ticket price at all. It's completely free form. Do whatever the hell you want. And so uh, we usually do about 55-45. So 55% donations, 45% merch. Uh, and this year, uh, our merch this year was 3% of our merch last year. But our donation, because like for us, it turns out people don't want to buy merch online. It's just not, a, like, there's a disconnect. Like so the impulse gets lost in translation. They wander by our table and they buy it in person. We do a ton of merch in person, like it shows. Uh, but the good news is that our donations were actually up 17% uh, from last year. We had our single biggest year in terms of donations ever doing it online, which is really weird and cool. Attendance uh, was an average of 13 people per show, which at an in-person show might be on the sparse side, like it might feel a little bit awkward and weird, but on a Zoom concert is just amazing. Everyone's Zoom box is a really nice size. There's enough people to keep it very visually interesting and energetically communicative, but not so many people that gets diffuse and weird and overwhelming and the sense of personal responsibility to the event dissipates, you know? Uh, we in fact found like we had some concerts where it was like, you know, 28 people, 35 people. Those were the least good concerts by far because people I think felt more license, more anonymity and it felt like they could like space out or turn off their camera or move their phone around or go for a walk or whatever. But when it's a 13 person show, everyone's really there with each other. There's that sense that we're all contributing our little piece to a bigger thing and it's, the energy is magical. That's so cool. That it's, it's really interesting to me, like, because all of the standard measurements are going out the window, you know, yeah, we're aiming for a thousand people, oh, really, you know, and here you are, 13 people, it's pretty good, and um, uh, I think on a few of these panels today, we talked about redefining success and expectations, and um, if you are... I, I found that there's this like success lag for some people where you're trying to succeed in the way things were five years ago that as you were coming up, you aspired to that level of success. And if you're trying to do that now, you are so screwed. You are so screwed. In many ways, I think that Shannon and I have found and like the pandemic time has really put a fine point on this, that our world has gotten better the smaller it's gotten. Like I think that both of us, 
we're really thinking, like you said, when we got started, you want to aim for the biggest possible success, the biggest possible crowds. With what we do, and especially like with the stuff that Shannon writes, it's so earnest and it's so emotional. And it's not for everybody. And the, when we have bigger audiences, a lot of the time, there's a percentage of people there who just don't want to hear that at all. They want to maybe get lightly drunk and hear someone play something pleasant. And she's talking about real life, super emotional, very deep stuff. And I think a lot of people are like, eh, this is bad for me and I don't, I don't like it. <laughs> and you can feel them being resentful toward the show and contributing bad energy, not good energy, you know? And like the smaller and more focused our audiences get, the better the experience gets for everybody, including us. I, yeah, uh, I do wanna say that I, I do feel for people like Sarah, where your band itself is big. Like I, like I think independent solo artists or like duos who can quarantine together um, are experiencing this in a different way than people with a big band. And I'm curious how, like have you started doing more solo stuff? Like are you, like have you thought about <laughs> renting a house and quarantining with your whole dang band? So you guys, like, I mean, what is a big, band supposed to do in a situation like this? I mean, maybe there's not a great answer, so I don't want to bring everything down, but I don't want to pretend like the world is great, because if you have an 18-person band, I imagine that you're not doing stuff like what we're talking about necessarily, unless you decide to become a solo artist. So what are right. your thoughts? Uh, my thoughts. I have so many. Um, I agree with you. Yeah, I can't really do this, and I mean, all the time, like my entire career, everyone's like, why don't you just make the band smaller? Why don't you just play the songs by yourself? And I've been like invited on sh little shows and stuff. Whatever, and they're like, just play piano and sing. And I'm like, it doesn't translate. Like this is like fully arranged work. You know, it's so hard for me to like break that all down for myself to like play on the piano. Um, so I would love to quarantine my whole band. I thought about that in the beginning of the quarantine because my friend operates Dreamland Studios upstate, and I was like, what if I just make everybody quarantine and we go up there? And then I was like, that's chaos. There are like two toilets. So um, I <laughs> decided not to do that. But I, yeah, it's definitely, I think a lot of my friends, most of my friends are jazz musicians. They're kind of having an easier time. Like they'll go out in the park and they'll busk or whatever, or, you know, they'll play shows like on Amplified at different restaurants and stuff around. And um, I don't really do those things. So I think I'm chronically at a disadvantage, even without COVID. You know, it's like, I need a big stage and I need a lot of people and I need a huge, ba you know, it's, it just, it's full production all the time. And not that I don't love this stuff. My boyfriend plays guitar and he's just like on Twitch all the time. Um, <laughs> but, you know, and I, I think it's wonderful and I'm super happy that people have this outlet, but I just, I think I'm super uncompromising and I'm, you know, it's like, I just want to do the New York Philharmonic stuff. It's my number one thing. And I don't want to, it's like, I've tried to break it down before and it's like, I hate that. I feel like I'm losing a piece of it because people, they're like, oh, just this will be so much easier and it's so much harder. It's like, this, these are my ideas. Like, if, you know, either we're doing this idea or we're not. I think that's the So point. like re recording remotely yeah. or making those Brady Bunch videos where you're each playing a part, is that kind of, have you done uh, one of those yet? I thought about it before, like literally right before everyone started doing it and then everyone did it and I was like, I'm gonna pass. Um, but we, yeah, the remote recording, that's fun. I mean, it's a little bit harder because you can't be in a controlled environment with all of these people, you know, like kind of producing it as it's happening. You kind of just have to take what you've got and work with it. Um, but yeah, that's been fun and that's been doable. And then we can, you know, release singles and none of us ever see each other, which is sad, but it works. So I appreciate yeah. you asking, by the way. <laughs> that's very yeah. thoughtful. I think that Sarah's touched on something really important here, too, for the people who are watching this which is that like, she's, she's not an entertainer, right? She's an artist and she has a vision and she has something she's aiming at. And, you know, it's not, ne it's not necessarily possible for every single person to abstract what they do down to a single person performance. And it shouldn't be. And like, it's really important, I think in this time, not to invalidate art forms that can't be done at a smaller scale. Like they're still mm -hmm. valid, still really important. And you have a thing that you're aiming at. And like, that's, that's just really, it's really important. And it's, I think really good that you have that at the forefront of your mind that like, this is who I am and this is what I do. Thank you. I appreciate that everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very kind. But I also think it would be cool, obviously, 
to be able to go down to your basement and perform all the time and do and have that outlet and be able to connect with people. Obviously, I'm missing that a lot. So, you know, it's, I'm very happy for everyone that is able to do that. Have you thought about like artist talks, like where you show music videos and talk about the story behind them? Like it's a different form of connecting. It's not like performing. Just out of yeah. curiosity. Sure. Because I mean, Pigface not... did that kind of, you know, that Pigface show online. We weren't playing at Pigface. Otherwise, we'd all be dead. So like just wondering if you thought about something like that. Uh, yeah, I've actually done a couple things like that with a few friends that are like YouTube creators. Um, and then we've done, you know, like premiered things and then had little Q&As with people and stuff like that. So I've done a couple things cool. like that. It's just we definitely need to build up more content yeah now, which we'll have in the new year it's like right now we've got a bunch of stuff and then we'll be releasing all of it but yeah that is cool. a great idea and i need to cool. do more of it <laughs> well, i can certainly uh, sympathize you know so my band pig face is five or five or six drummers with kits uh three <laughs> players i mean 27 30 people on stage and um i think uh, yeah, I, I, it would just be a ridiculous mistake to try and recreate that with me with a tambourine, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or it you would be know. awesome. You never know. You should try it once before you knock it, dude. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think when people would start, start to question the whole idea, like, I used to like this, but this guy seems to, what is going, this just, validates a bunch of, mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. stuff. and so I just like I, I'm teaching my touring class online I'm doing things like this uh, you know uh, I think about a uh, Blixer from Einstein's and Neubarten who did a cooking show you know so you're still connecting with people I don't know I don't know what your omelets are like Sarah but maybe okay that, that, that Sarah McDonald cooks an omelet. I don't eat eggs, but Sarah McDonald cooks a pizza. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think something that Galen said, and also what you were just saying just now, Martin, this idea of connecting. You know, like one of the things I think that we've learned over the years is that for us, music is like one point of connection, but and it often is the front door of connection where people get to know us and get to know the other people who support we do. Or who support who support what we do, um, but we're learning that like that once those people are in our house, they come to the front door of the music. Maybe that there's so many other ways that they want to connect, and that we are able to help facilitate connect connection. Um, and so, like you know, in our case, we started a podcast a couple of years ago, and from that podcast, uh, we developed this this Patreon support community, sort of under that umbrella. And folks that support our Patreon, which is the other big pivot we did when coronavirus hit this year, was we really pushed uh, mm -hmm. the, the Patreon stuff. And honestly, the Patreon is now like, you know, it's, it's helping us cover like uh, about half, a little more 60%. than 60%. Oh, 60% of our monthly budget that we wow. budget needs, you know, which is a big deal, you know. Um, but, but we're like, we just started with our, our patron community last night was our very first monthly zoom meetup just for our patrons. And it was awesome because it, we're, it wasn't about music at all. Um, that's how the people, some of, most of the people initially came to us, but the zoom meetup was just all about people getting to know each other and connecting with each other and sharing stuff that they've been going through and how they're feeling. And that was valuable to them. We were just sort of the facilitators of that, but you know, having to kind of think about the other ways that we, that we connect and stay connected beyond just performance, beyond just, you know, music um, has been really valuable for us. And I think that actually after COVID is all over, these are going to be really important ways in which we can continue to be connected with our people in between tours, in between album cycles, in between the, the music storyline that we're telling we can maintain these meaningful connections with people. And it's really meeting a need in their lives, you know, like um, they've been drawn to this niche thing that we're doing and, and look, they've found other like-minded people. And, that, and yeah. that's really cool. We've learned yeah. through what we're doing that for us, music is not the end point. It's not the thing that we want people to do. It's the beginning of the conversation. So I would agree. 
with that because even at my live my live shows, um, I was like, well, what do I have that I can offer the world right now besides just playing my songs, which I don't have like a thousand songs. I've probably only written like 15 original songs and then I work on fiddle tunes and blah, blah, blah. And I want to keep writing, obviously. But like, I was like, there's no way I can do this for a whole year. And having the guests has been cool because my brother Ben is a writer and he was my guest last week. And he's like, you know what I thought was remarkable is like 1500 people have seen that video since last week, right? And he's like, and you only played for maybe 20 minutes at the end. So it means that everyone really was there for this conversation between you and your brother about writing and the pandemic and stuff. And like, so you're right, like music is a huge part of what all of us do. But then there is like touring, you're not playing music 24 hours of touring, you're, there's a lot of other crap that goes on. And it's kind of fun to like, talk about that with a different artist of like, you know, what we're doing right now, basically, is also yeah. cool. And it's, it's not, um, uh, I, I, that phrase, leaving it all on the stage. But when we go out with Pig Face, I try and leave it all. I think the fair thing to do is leave it all on the stage. Oh, yeah. And, but that, the more I do that, the more spit blood and whatever is, is all over the, the stage. As much as I'd like to talk to everybody afterwards, you know, after about an hour, as I've said a few times, I want to be, I'm going to be in my bunk, crying myself to sleep in pain, taking ibuprofen and putting <laughs> on the cross sheets, you know? And so, um, uh, that's, that, this connectedness is something I'm going to take out on the road next time. I don't know how I'm going to deal with it because this 24 seven thing is something that I don't know we, how that's going to affect everybody. We've, we've talked a few times today about making time for yourself and taking care of yourself. But um, to a large extent, I think some of that stuff is just going out the window. Um, so how will, how will the next time you go out be different? That's a great question. I, I mean, I think that all of us are kind of having to wait and see what the world is going to be looking like in the coming months, you know. Um, I think that it's possible that we might go back out in a more scaled down way next time we're able to um, just inch back into <laughs> the in-person world. But again, I mean, we don't know when a vaccine's coming. Like, there's just so much that we're gonna just have to flow with. Um, the, the benefit of doing the kind of touring that we do where we're, we're booking house concerts with people in their homes, it's not the kind of tour that you have to book out six months in advance. So we have a little bit more flexibility in terms of being able to turn on a dime when pandemic news comes for us, you know? Um, I wish I had more to offer than that. Maybe somebody else has a better idea. One idea that we, that Shannon and I have talked about, and this goes back to the idea of making our thing even smaller than it currently is, is uh, it, it, we're, tr we're still trying to figure out how best to drive away looky loots. You know what I mean? Like, and only have at our shows the people who bring the most to it for other people, you know? And we, so we've been tossing around the idea of maybe doing some shows that, I mean, we'll, we'll still do like Shannon Curtis tour shows but then also maybe some shows will be like an evening of conversation with shannon and jamie you know what i mean and maybe we'll do a couple of songs but maybe the bulk of the experience will be actually people sharing with each other you know and getting like con having conversation with one another well you know there was um there was a there was a whole growth of stand-up in the uk i want to say mid 70s to early 80s where artists like billy Connolly who, I don't know if, that, if he's familiar to anybody as a Scottish comedian, but he was a freaking banjo player. And he would like, in between a couple of songs, he'd say something funny, you know, and then slowly this, there was more story than banjo to the point where, you know, later in his career when he brought out a banjo, people were like, what the hell's going on with the banjo? So there's definitely... Um, arcs where this is it's very interesting stories are really interesting oxytocin all all of that stuff is going on with a story 
um, that's really interesting to me. That's, I mean, that's one of the reasons I wanted to do the scratch and sniff because of the, the story plus the, the olfactory. It's the deepest, hardest, uh, longest lasting pathway to the memory banks, you know. Um, here's a question for, uh, for Jamie um, from y Yiting Liang. What platform uh, do you do the virtual tour on? Does it integrate donation, fan interaction, etc.? I'm sorry, I started talking before the second half of the question. Can you say the second half again after platform? <laughs> I think that's it. Oh, and what's your experience with these platforms if you've done it on different ones and what are the fees like? Yeah, so I integration have- Integration of payment too is what he was saying earlier. Oh, I don't understand the question, integration of payment. How, so we, we're doing them on Zoom. Um, yeah, we're doing them on Zoom. Uh, but to be clear, like we're not just setting up a phone like we have now aiming at us doing music. Uh, I've got like, a you know, $10,000 worth of audio gear sitting like out of camera, you know. Uh, there's a couple different mixers. There's, a, there's an analog mixer that I'm using to do stuff in real time. There's a digital mixer that I'm using to sum what I'm doing with what Shannon's doing and then put some limiting across it and like kind of I'm doing like a proper broadcast level output with this thing, properly compressed, properly EQ'd, properly limited. Uh, like it's a studio quality connection going, going out over Zoom, sonically speaking. Uh, so we're paying for the monthly Zoom subscriptions that we can have up to 100 people and then the time isn't limited. Right. It's like 15 bucks a month, which was yeah. totally worth it for us. In terms of like the payment scheme, um, we're just, what we do, because we do our, normally at our in-person shows, at the end of the concert, the host gets up at the front of the show, of, of the stage area with a vase or a pitcher and is like, appeal to, appeals to the, the crowd's generosity and says, here's where you make your donations. They plop that on my piano and people will come and do what they do, right? In the virtual format, obviously that doesn't work. So we're doing all virtual payments. And what we do is we just, we set up, we've set up what we call a, host concert portal <laughs> it's just a website a web page on our website if that anyone has... wants to see it it's still there oh yeah you can look at it it's uh the for the tour it was shannoncurtis.net slash whisper and th that refers to the name of the record that we were touring on this summer um but you can just see what it looks like it's got all of our social media connections it's got our our newsletter sign up list that ill-fated merch area the merch area <laughs> it's got the uh, a, a link to our podcast and then at the very top, though, there's all the payment links, PayPal, Venmo, Zelle, you know, what, how, however people want to pay us, they can pay us. And we give that to them at the end of the concert. And then we also have our host um, send out a post like the day after the concert. Thanks for coming, everybody. Here's that post concert portal. Don't forget to do what you will with that. So that's how we've, we've worked it out. There you go. That's so, oh, sorry, Galen. Go ahead. Well, so I was just going to say, so slightly different, I am doing my shows on YouTube, and they're, they're live, but obviously they stay up after, and I have gone through a few different platforms. I was using StreamYard for a while, which is free, well, not free, I paid $25 a month, but it was, like, um, easy to have guests, because they would just click on a link, and they would show up, and, and the sound quality was really good for a while, but unfortunately, I only had a Chromebook, and so when they upgraded their sound, my violin started sounding terrible. So I eventually had to invest in a real computer, like a, a Windows computer for gamers. It's a predator. It's very weird that I have that computer. But um, I, I learned, I'm learning how to use OBS. And so OBS is a streaming platform that allows for good audio that's like coming, kind of what Jamie's saying, it comes right out. Um, but I have my guests on Zoom. And so I'm capturing the Zoom screen and putting it over there. Um, and it, so I want to just say that I cried after every show pretty frequently, still probably will, because I'm not a tech person and I don't enjoy it at all. I fucking hate it, actually. So um, this was not like, a, I mean, it's, I wanted to do it and I knew that it was important to keep my career going and to have a weekly commitment because most of my fans are pretty serious about being locked down and they're not going to any live shows that not even outside so like this is important for them too and so just so you know um the the learning curve is steep and hard if you're not naturally gifted at tech and so um 
but the tips, the thing that I do like about YouTube is since the video lives on, I have the tip links in every YouTube video. And once or twice a week, I like get a notification that I have $20 in my PayPal that's not even really linked to like, I have no idea what show they were watching from what week, um, but they're just donating. So there are ways, it's fun, but it's it was and still will be frustrating as well. And so the ultimate goal has to be, this has to be really important to you to put that much work into it because holy crap, you know what I mean? I don't know if you guys have cried, but I cried after a lot of different shows because you'd think it was going and then you like look back and your violin, the audio somehow wasn't translating and you're like, why? <laughs> you know, like work. And so I don't know, it was, but it's good. I mean, it's worth it, but it was very hard at the beginning and still kind of is, so. I'm really glad you said that because like, <laughs> Thinking about my response versus yours, like I think yours is probably more helpful to people, honestly. Like we're really lucky because I'm an engineer and we have an yeah, engineer. Yeah, I was like, house. can't Jamie live with me and fix all my <laughs> stuff? Most people don't. I know, right? But like, <laughs> and that's lucky that we have that and it enables us to do stuff. But yes. also like, it's not necessary. The storytelling and the emotional connection is the point. And anyone watching this can do that in front of a phone. It's about making a connection with other human beings. And honestly, in the wrong hands, like the tech can really get in the way. I have seen live streams where the tech was really emotionally distancing, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And sometimes someone just pouring their heart out in front of their Samsung or whatever, it's just like, that's the good stuff. There's no wrong way yeah. to do it. Just use the tools you have. Mm -hmm. And in mine's now it's like, I do have the tech sort of, I mean, I have the audio dialed in. That was important to me. I really wanted it to try to sound good. Um, the visuals, I'm in front of my same kitchen table every single week. I don't really care, like, because it's not really about that. But um, but that was the hard part is there is a learning curve. There is some good resources out there if you Google it. But if you're not tech minded, just prepare yourself to, you know, it's, it's just part of like somebody said, well, at the end of this, we'll all know so much more. And I agree with that. Like at the end of this, I plan to keep doing live shows online once in a while because I have guests. Oh, this is the cool part that I forgot to say. I have guests on my show. So maybe there's 35 people live. And then over the week, maybe a thousand more watch it some, at some point during the week, right? Those 35 people are from countries all over the world, most of which I've never been to. So like Brazil, there's pe people that come from Brazil every single week. And I think the biggest benefit to me besides the interaction that can happen live, especially for a platform like YouTube where they can kind of find you and then they show up, is that it connects people from all over the globe. So we're talking, like in the chat, they're talking about oh, we're locked down here, we're not locked down here. Oh, it's summer here. What's, you know, like, and it's really cool to just, everybody's having this intercultural experience at the same moment. And I think that that is something I don't want to give up. Um, I'll, I maybe won't even get to Brazil, who knows? I had no plans on my roster at the time. I think so who knows? Going back to the Melissa Etheridge uh, experience, <laughs> um, uh, she took her, her views from Facebook to a customized site through a platform called Maestro. And uh, the thing that we're seeing with the free touring class on a Monday, there's uh, Jez from New Zealand is on that call. We've got people from El Salvador. When we ran MMX um, in May, we had people from 23 countries instead of 230 miles radius of Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, there's that silver lining. Um, element and and certainly with a platform like zoom you can keep in touch you know who's you know who's online for how long for on which devices and um and how to stay in touch with them in the future which is that's a whole other aspect of this yeah and you decide at some point galen holy crap i was going to go back to ireland because i like guinness but which i do yeah i know but um but there's 500 people from South America over this last year that have been part of my, I should really go to, and now you've got a database, you can, you can ask them where you should be and how you should go down there. Yep, yep. It's, yeah. yeah, it can guide your future decisions. Uh, the analytics as, I mean, okay, all of us are realistically, if we're doing this for a living, we are all also entrepreneurs, right? And so the nerd in me, is like what country are people watching from? And you're right, but that can kind of help guide 
your decision. The one thing I have to start doing is trying to direct people from my shows to like my newsletter or my Patreon. And that's what I'm trying to do is figure out how to make a connection that's more permanent than just like the show that they watch. Um, as an entrepreneur who wants to just be able to keep playing music for an actual living rather than having to get a day job, um, there's a lot behind the scenes to figure out. It's interesting. Any, uh, any parting words as we wrap up our, what is, what's the, what's the panel before the, is this the penultimate panel? Yes. Yeah. Um, and I, I just saw Laura said in the, in the chat, um, she often gets more people in the pre-concert talking about the concert than the concert itself. Interesting, it's really interesting, interesting stuff going on. Uh, absolutely. So um, uh, before we um, before we start our last panel of the day, are there any parting comments from from any of you? And, and thank you all so much for doing this. By the way. Yeah, you know, I'll just leave my email address for people. I do this every time I do one of these. I know that there are people uh, who may have questions that I can help with, like from, from an engineering or technical standpoint. Uh, every so often there might be someone who is like, yeah, I would like to talk to you about home recording or something. I'm always here for that. My email is jamie, J-A-M-I-E, at secretagentaudio.com. Maybe Molly can put that in the chat but it's jamie at secretagentaudio.com. I really wanna emphasize, especially for like younger people and students watching this, if I can be of service to you, if my knowledge can benefit you in some way, please let me know and we'll make it happen. Thank you. Sarah, anything you wanna add? I was just gonna say, I'll give you my social media handles, I guess, that just follow the New York Chill Harmonic, it's NY Chill Harmonic. There's just the one, you can't miss it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, or Sarah, S-A-R-A-M-C-D-S. I'll write it down. But is we have lots of stuff coming, so. Is there chill harmonic merchandise? Sort of. <laughs> There's some stuff. I, we have more things coming, but I also haven't pushed that either. I feel so bad, like, everyone's talking about all these things that they've been up to, and I'm just like, I can't wait to play a live gig. <laughs> so, that's I that. I love that, that too. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, I just wanted to say thanks for having me and um, that I think it's okay to keep reinventing the wheel as we go. Like I just started my own monthly Zooms, like what you were talking about for my patrons. And I think just like hearing what other people do are doing is an inspiring way to kind of get new stuff. And if you suck at it at the beginning, don't give up, basically, is my yeah. advice. Yeah. Hmm. That's such good advice. And I think <laughs> my, my, if I could offer a parting word, you know, this year and all the challenges that it's thrown all of us, um, you know, I, I think one of the things that has been a benefit to me and something that I really want to continue in my work going forward is that really when you have to figure out what your pivot's going to be in a time of crisis and challenge like this, it really is important to begin that search for the pivot with an acknowledgement uh, and a declaration of what your values are for what you do and start from that place as you invent the new path forward, you know? And so I think that, you know, that's something that I think that will benefit all of us, you know, going forward as we, you know, continually, like you said, Galen, we're entrepreneurs, we're continually inventing and reinventing how we do what we do. And if we can make those decisions about how to move forward from a value centered starting mm -hmm. place, I think that that lands us on paths that end up being fulfilling and successful for us, you know? The, the very, very tiny last thing, I know we have to go, but the reason that I'm so gung-ho about online shows right now is people with disabilities um, are dying at a higher rate from COVID than pretty much almost anyone else. And I don't want to have people feel like they should have to go to my show because they want to see me. I don't want them to put themselves at risk because they're like, oh, but I really want to see her live and she's coming to my town and should I go or shouldn't I go? And then they freaking die. Like, I don't want that. So that's why online is really important to me. And I would urge you guys to think about as you do go back in the world, uh, that's fine. But like how you have to do it in a way that's safe because even if the people with disability don't go to your show, their caretakers might go and that's how they're getting it. So like, it's really important to be safe. Like that's sorry to mom you all but no, that's, that's how i'm ending it wear a mask be 
steadfast in your yes. mask wearing. <laughs> yes. The whole country needs mom and Galen. Thank you yes. for that. <laughs> and just to be encouraging, I tell people who are making their own t-shirts, don't worry if you smudge the shirt because you smudged it. And yes. Exactly. This, this, these are my thumbprints, motherfucker. And, <laughs> and you will be amazed and surprised that, that the extent to which you stumble through a new platform, everybody is so forgiving right now. Yeah. Five, six yeah. Months, what the fuck? This isn't HD. There's a problem with light. Well, now you can, you can do this. You can do this. <laughs> yep. Yep. Oh, yeah, okay, sorry, yeah, I do need to do this as well. You can do this, and, you know, <laughs> you know, people are so forgiving uh, and, and so supportive, you know, which is, which is all, I think we're uncovering what that relationship really is, mm -hmm. you know, which lets you make mistakes and yeah. uh, the basis of all of it. Well, um, we're only... For a for a set for a seven hour event to only be running four five minutes behind, I think that's miraculous. Um, I just want to say um, uh, before we dip out for just a couple of minutes before our last panel, I want to let everybody know that this is something that um, our students at Millican University uh, put together with myself and Molly. Uh, the university is crazily supportive of all of the things that we do. Wendy Day was on uh, the panel before this. She came out as a mentor on two tour buses that we were allowed to take around the country with students on a bus. <laughs> and, uh, at some point, I want to warn everybody, uh, you'll be getting an email from us with information about a new program at Millican and how to get uh, waitlisted when a a new music industry path becomes available at Millican, which we've been working on for two years now. Cool. This conference is part of it. The, uh, say what, Molly? Molly just put a, a thing in the chat because Molly's awesome. Um, so um, thank you, uh, um, uh, Sarah, uh, Jamie Shannon, and Galen. Uh, we're gonna dip out for a three minute video um, before we start our last panel with Michael Alago. And for, if, if you feel like sticking around, um, Michael has a storied path that goes from uh, signing Metallica at age 24 to working wow. executive producing Nina Simone's uh, last album. Wow. Uh, he's a crazy, crazy awesome uh, individual. So um, thank you, everyone. And we'll be back with Michael Thank Alago. you, Martin. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you, Jamie and Shannon and Martin and you too. Sarah, too. Thank you, Sarah. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. See ya.